hardcore boxing fans out there, how are you doing? It's Big Porky here. You know, don't you? You know. Today I'm joined by Rico from London, and we're going to talk about the sport of boxing. How are you doing, Rico? I'm good, thank you. It's Wednesday morning, breakfast with Porky. I know. Eat bacon sandwiches and a good chat. With tutti fruity brown sauce, mate. HP. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know why I like uh, brown sauce but the fruity brown sauce the fruit sauce I just can't get that one are you, are you old it. school Rico old school yeah proper you know brown sauce like you get a calf do, you have, do they have daddies down there or HP cafes if you, when you go to the calves you get that little brown bottle that you can't tell what make is <laughs> you know, <the> <laughs> yeah right all right then. Uh, boxing's uh, what's the word? Been in the headlines for the last Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, one last week or so on it with the Frank Warren show. What did you make of it all, Rico, from start to finish? I only watched the main events, and that's what I always planned to do because I didn't think the card was particularly good. But I heard that that Hamza kid fought really well and. I've met his trainer before and he raves on about him. And I think a lot of people seem to think that Hamza kid's really good and good on that. But um, yeah, the main event, I don't know. It felt like the venue was, they were saying it was historic Churchill house. I did feel a bit budget to me. It felt like worse than your court. It didn't really feel to me. They might have a historic venue, but it just felt really flat as, the atmosphere because there wasn't much echo or yeah I just didn't like the venue and I didn't think the production was the best but putting all of that aside it was a good fight I mean, we can't complain and I think it was an excellent fight two heavyweights fighting uh, gallantly and you know putting on an entertaining fight so I thought it was very good good card uh, because I only care about the main event yeah, uh, what did you think to the uh, main event then? Yeah, well, as I said, I think it was a good main event. I think it's a shame that people focus on the ending um, rather than the fight. I thought it was close competitive fights. Um, we learned a lot about both fighters. Um, and in terms of the ending, you know, we're not here, but as a boxing fan, I don't want to see somebody stretch it out the ring or I don't want to see somebody take the beating that Kelbrook took and, you know, that, that impact their career. And if the referee and the ringside doctors aren't willing to do anything and, you know, your corner doesn't pull you out. So sometimes, you know, sometimes you just have to do what you got to do. But I definitely wouldn't call that quitting because who am I to sit here in front of a camera and tell that the fighters need to be wanting to die in the ring uh, when I have an office job and I'm a fan of the sport. So there's enough damage and injuries in the sport and there's enough lasting damage. You only have to think about. Do you feel that uh, Ian John Lewis bottled it as regards walking Daniel Dubar over to the, the, the doctor uh, uh, in, in the fight? Because not once did he uh, refer him to the doctor to have a look at it, did he? Yeah, I, I think he should have done that. Um, but I think also maybe the doctor should have looked at that. But yeah, yeah, I think he definitely should have done that because the eye was closing fast and it wasn't something that he sort of suddenly appeared. So I think for the health and safety of the fighter, you should probably ask the question, why didn't Ian John Lewis request that? Do you feel that Ian John Lewis, every time he comes on now, he sort of panders towards the the, uh, the the home promoter. For example, we know we know about the scorecards and he's judging it, mm -hmm. past, don't we? And he's refereeing in the past on uh, favouring hometown promoters. Do you feel that he didn't refer Daniel Dubois to the to the doctor to look at the eye, even in between rounds, because it's the Frank Warren show and Daniel Dubois is the rising star. Or at the time with the rising star, do you feel that he bottled it? Yeah, but we all know. Look at Tyson Fury against uh, Otto Wallin. It's not just what UK refs do. It's, 
You know, that Tyson Fury against Otto Wallin fight, that should have been stopped, right? Mm -hmm. It's clear as day. The guy has a gushing hole on top of his eye and requires plastic surgery and loads of stitches, and you're telling me that should have continued. If you back, you're so gone. Yeah, I mean, look, look, there's rules in boxing and there's the reality, and sadly those two things are intertwined, but they're not the same thing, and probably that was a reason. Yeah, and John Lewis probably thought, actually, I'm not going to start putting the set risk that the fight gets stopped. But in some ways, he probably would have done Daniel uh, Dubois a favour if he would have done that just around before he got stopped because then that would have been an out. But the outcome was, I think, evident in that fight. Once the eyes started closing, he was either going to be pulled out by the corner, he was either going to be stopped by the ringside doctors, or you know he was going to take more damage and ultimately be stopped somehow. Yeah. Do you remember the Amir Khan, Paul McCloskey fight? That got stopped on a nothing cut, didn't it? Yes. Yeah. That were, that were pandering to the promoters, wasn't it? And that, uh, I don't, I, I can't remember referee on that. I don't think it re and John Lewis, but point I want to make is that why didn't the doctor want to look at it? And, uh, um, I mean, it just seems to me that the kid were left to carry on, one with one eye. From yeah, a... I'm not sure. Um, one of the things I'll say is I'm not sure. I don't know well enough. Do the board tend to use the uh, same doctors? I don't think they do. Mm. And also, because there is this pandemic going on, you might have, you know, less qualified doctors. But either way, yeah, the doctors should have looked at it. I think... Personally, I think it's a, a sequence of events, you know, like the Titanic. It didn't just sink because they hit an iceberg or clipped an iceberg. It were a series of events leading up to it. And I think Daniel Debar, you've got all these uh, powerful characters involved. You've got boxing board of control, referee wanted to please promoter. Promoter, we BT Sport on his back. Daniel Debar, obviously, trying his best. And everybody tried looking at after their own agendas, and it and it's ended up a recipe for disaster. And if the kid doesn't fight again, I think that questions are going to have to be asked. They're already sweating, aren't they, on this this uh, injury, aren't they? There's been a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes, and a lot of things said, and things were said in the heat of the moment after the fight. And do you think that Ed's are going to roll if he don't fight again? Do you see legal problems? Well, you can't force someone to fight, right? But, um, yeah, I mean, it would be a massive loss of investment. And, again, ultimately, it's two heavyweights there fighting against each other. One guy ends up smashing the other guy's eye socket in. These things happen in heavyweight boxing. Was he brought on too fast? I'd say no, because... You know what? If I if I would have thought, I would have said that before the fighters would have everybody else who are now very wise after the event. There's a lot of people now yeah. going around saying all this stuff about how this was always going to happen. I think most people thought it was a 50-50 fight. I mean, I favoured Dubois, but I put money on Joe Joyce to win on points um, because the odds were good. But there's a lot of people now I have opinions about how he was managed, how he was matched. Um, everything about the guy is now sort of plain to be seen. It's a bit like um, when Joshua lost, right? Not so much in the UK. There was obviously you that was calling this stuff out, but some other people afterwards said some frailties that were evident. Uh, and that was your day in the sun. But in this case, it's exactly the same, right? Except people feel that because it's a guy that's not constantly an IFL and not, you know, a media darling and a Frank Warren fighter, they've got the right to go out there and, you know, give him advice or, you know, call him a quit or whatnot. Do you feel that straight after the fight, uh, the mainly, uh, mainly, and I'm, and I'm going to say his name, Coogan Cassius, Rob Tebbert, do you think they felt the need to go after Dubar and with the headline clicky clickbaiting, he quit. Dave Caldwell says he quit. 
Macklin says he quit. Billy Joe says he quit. The list is endless. It can go on and on and on and on. And then within within a few hours, they're doing the same interview and the same titles on Boxing Social. Do you feel that they have basically played their hand now and said, look, we're Eddie Hearn men, you know, Tebbit and Cassius? No, I think I think it's just about game views, isn't it? And it makes compelling all action source of you. Uh, so I think I think oh, they, tough, um, they know they know that people will want to watch it. Uh, because we don't get that in football, do we? If um, if Spurs lose to Liverpool in the Champions League final, we don't suddenly get every single manager in the Premier League telling us how Spurs didn't play well the night, right? Yeah. Uh, we don't get that in MMA. We don't get loads of... I don't follow MMA, but I'm pretty sure we don't have hundreds of trainers and coaches and everybody else involved in sports saying that somebody, Conor McGregor, isn't as good as... Norgerman or whatever that Russian guy is when he loses because they all understand that it takes away from the sport if you diminishing something that was a good night of boxing um, so I don't think they've sort of, they probably haven't but what it is is people using somebody else's uh, misfortune or sort of mishap I wouldn't even call it anything it's just a loss right it's a competitive fight and they lost and they're using that to promote their own agendas and promote themselves, which, as grown men, I feel is very shameful. And just, you know, you look at these guys that are doing it. Could you trust them now? If no. you were a boxer, could you? Tr- do you think they trustworthy people? Do you think they wouldn't do the same for you as a fighter? Or... Yeah. I think all boxers should be worried now that if they get in a big fight. They don't go their way or something happens that these people are just going to savage them. Do you know what I mean? And, and are they going to give other people bullets to fire and let them, let them do it and just sit back and collecting hundreds of pounds per interview in, in ad money on YouTube. I think it's well. Right. You think, you think about it, right? We all won 50, 50 fights. And I think everybody said this was a good fight uh, to make in credit to Frank Warren on non-pay-per-view. And it was a competitive fight. And then you lose this fight and suddenly everybody starts saying it was terrible matchmaking. Um, the fight that loses gets slagged off uh, by most people from the other side of the road. So what's the incentive of making 50-50 fights? I mean, boxing fans can't have it both ways. You can't say we want these good fights and we want prospects fighting each other. And then when somebody loses... It's they don't match properly, or when somebody, you know, we can't be crying for Patrick Day and Mike Towel and you know Scott Westgarth and then say that fighters need to fight until they get pulled out of the ring or they're lying on the canvas. What's that about? Yeah, we don't want any deaths in the ring, do we? Or bad injuries. I think my own opinion is if if Martin Bowers had pulled him out after round nine. I don't think anybody has had a problem with it. We could be talking about a rematch. But now, the, because he went down on one knee, I mean, he probably just had enough. I mean, it's, it's an hard one, isn't it? Because you've got a six foot six, 18 and a half stone man punching you in the same place on something that's broken and, and punching and punching you. And I don't know. It, look, you can only. You, you can only go so far, can't you, I suppose, with, tech, with, with pain. And maybe Terry's right. Maybe his brain just shut down for them split seconds. And afterwards, he probably thought, oh, I wish I'd have carried on. But it's too late yeah. then, isn't it? You can't, I mean, look, you can't simulate. Obviously, you can spar and you can do everything else. But the only ones you actually get into that position in a fight, you know, you know you'll see how you react to it. And, and again, look, he's, he needs to use his eye for the rest of his life. Yeah. There's more important things than boxing. You yeah. know, in a UFC, right? When you do things like arm bars or things where they put your arm in a thing and the other guy sort of stretches the arm and they tap out, right? Yeah. If the other guy doesn't tap out, they end up breaking his arm. 
Yeah. The UFC talk acceptable that you tap out and then nobody says you're quitted because you realize there's nothing you can do in that situation. See, boxing was the UFC. Every time somebody didn't allow their arm to be broken, the fans would say that they're a coward or they're a quitter, right? Yeah, good point. And Kel Brook, I think I tweeted the other day and a few people liked it. I think Kel Brook wishes that um, Domingo would have pulled him out early or, you know, he would have never taken that fight because look yeah. at the impact his eye had on not just the rest of his career, but the Spence fight, right? Yeah. Um, and his psyche. He probably should have just, the moment he realised that there was something wrong with his eye, because remember he kept on doing this with his glove. If he would have taken a knee, he might have been called a quitter, but at least it might have saved him from further damage. Yeah. What do you think about the the matchmaking leading up to Daniel DeVar's fight with the juggernaut, Joe Joyce? What do you think about the matchmaking? So... I was looking at this yesterday. Before Anthony Joshua fought against Dillian White, I wouldn't say these are equal fights as such because White was quite raw, but White was a name. He didn't really fight anyone, right? He fought, he fought against Jason Gavin and, you know, these type of opponents. And he was put into that fight. Uh, had he lost, people would have said the same thing, matchmaking. Um, but... Daniel Dubois had beaten um, Nathan Gorman, probably at age 21, right? 21, 22, he beat Nathan Gorman. So that's quite a feat. And I, I personally don't subscribe to the orthodoxy that we can say after the event that somebody it wasn't matched correctly when they had a betting favour. How could you say that after the event? They were meant to blow this guy out. They didn't. It happens in boxing, right? Um, remember when... Um, Chad Dawson was it Chad Dawson that fought against Stevenson yeah Stevenson had lost to Darnell Boone I think it was and he went in there knocked him out in the first round cold and Chad Dawson had just come off a loss to Andre Ward I think or maybe he fought Ward after but, he had, but he'd beaten a good string of opponents anyways <laughs> sometimes you know sometimes everything works for you on the night sometimes your game plan's better sometimes the other guy can't expect what's coming to you if Dubois can't beat Joyce at age 23, you should come again. Look at here, right? He fought against Joe Parker. He lost. He fought against Povetkin. He lost. But he's a young heavyweight. He's got a bright future in the game. He's a loss. It's the protection of the O that people are obsessed with. But then, on the other hand, they want competitive fights. Would you rather have him lost at this level or at 23? or waiting until he was 28, got world title shot, not fought against anybody but Gorman, and then got, you know, lost at that level. If he learns from it, it's good matchmaking, in my opinion. It's a fight that he was meant to win. Do you feel that uh, Martin Bowers in the corner were harsh on the bar? I mean, it's a fine line, isn't it? It's a fine line, isn't it? I mean, look, I'm sitting my study and I'm commenting on a guy that I've never met and a trainer that I've never met, what their relationship is and what G's up the other guy. Who am I to say anything about that? I know, obviously, Terry Terry has his opinion. Terry's spent a lot of time with Dubois. He knows him. Uh, I don't think I can really pass judgment on what a trainer should say. And I think your point on Teddy Atlas and Povetkin, I think it was. And um, do you remember Tim Bradley when he said, you're a fireman and that? Thing. all of that stuff if it comes off great if it doesn't but you need to do something to wake up your fight if they aren't fighting at their best capacity if if Daniel Dubois had knocked him out in round 10 Martin Bowers would now be a hero wouldn't he so there's a fine line isn't there a trainer does what they think is best and it's a judgement call I mean that's yeah. the reality I thought Eddie Hearn's comments about Martin Bowers were out of order because we've seen many trainers trying to G the fighters up and say say what they think is necessary at the time. So for I think for Eddie Earn to be stirring pot like that and probably trying to steer Daniel Dubois away from his trainer into the matchroom fold for the Sims or Tony Sims or or, or whoever he what whoever he's got lined up for him. Because if Eddie takes a fighter on, he likes to put his guys, his team around them, don't he? His men, you know, your Coldwells and. 
Well, Bowers is a Frank Warren trainer, isn't it? Well, in, 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 in the sense that a lot of his fighters yeah, yeah. were Frank Warren. Yeah. So I wouldn't say he's a Frank Warren house trainer, but what I'm saying is a lot of his fighters work and there's certain gyms that Eddie Hearn works with and there's certain gyms that Frank uh, works with. Yeah. All right, then. Moving on. Uh, be- I, I will say one thing. I, I think Terry is very accurate in the point that they didn't probably invest in the opponents. I'm not saying the Japanese guy they brought over that was eating all sorts of food before the fight. You know, you could have probably thought about smarter matchmaking if you were going to face Joe Joyce. You know, people are more like him. You know, somebody that's a Kevin Johnson plus that's a, you know, not the hardest puncher, but a tricky opponent and somebody that's a very durable, all action uh, type fighter, isn't it? I mean, you could probably match him better, but it's not. It's about the budget of the show as much as it is about um, what opponents are willing to fight Daniel Dubois. Yeah, I'll just more or less go into that. Where does this leave BT Sport now? And will they be uh, happy with what's gone on? Well, it seems like they've got a contract with Joe Joyce. So I think they'll be. I don't think they'll be distraught, but it's probably not good for them. They filled up this guy, and it's the stable was more or less Yard and Dubois, um, who Frank took punts on. Two guys that probably weren't never going to be signed by Matchroom, anyways. So it's not great for BT, but we've seen this before. I mean, when Joshua lost, it wasn't the end of Sky. Um, or the zone, in fact. There's a lot of other factors that go into they've got some good young talent BT sports. So, you know, it's a, it's a tough position for them because they've invested a lot of money in this guy, but it depends how, what happens to Dubois, right? Does he ever come back? Is he the same fighter? What happens? Yeah. Uh, let's draw a line under this now then. Uh, what next for Daniel Dubois? What should he do? I- will recover first and foremost and then come back and get his confidence, maybe fight against a guy that isn't there, you know, that will give him a hard night's fight but doesn't really have the punching power. So, you know, someone like Charles Martin might be a good opponent for him if they can pay him. (laughs) Yeah, do you see him fighting Joe Joyce in, in the near future or do you think you might get him down the line, so to speak? I think Joe, Joe Joyce probably has three years, two, three years left in the sport and he'll probably, they'll try and push him to a world title shot as quick as possible. So there's probably not enough time in the career, but, you know, Dubois, you know, he's got a lot of good fights. He's only 23, so there's a lot of time left on the clock. And I think he's more of the batch of Joker, Hergovic, uh, Hugh Fury, sort of that crop of, next generation of heavyweights, that's more where he's probably end up fighting for a world title or his next big fight against one of those guys. Mm. All right, then. Well, we wish Daniel Dubois uh, all the luck in the world. What I would say to him, if I were, say, for instance, if I were in his team or around him, I said, look, why don't you just stay away from boxing for six months just go do what you've got to do. You've been at it since you were. You turned pro as a teenager, didn't he? Yeah. Get out of box. Nineteen or something. Hey. Nineteen or something. He turned pro. Yeah. Take a break. Take six months off. Just do it. You know. Just tick over and just go for a trot in the morning, a run or summer, and just stay out of way. Stay out at gyms. Just go enjoy yourself and go find yourself a little bit, and then look at it, and 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 see who your pals are. I suppose because. We all remember when Liam Cameron won Commonwealth and he got ranked in top. He was ranked number twelve with IBF. Everybody, he would everybody's everybody wanted to be his pal. And then when he got his four year ban, he found out about what it's all about, didn't he? Well, that's the that's the sad bit about boxing, isn't it? Mm. It's uh, I can't remember who said it, but. You know, when they're winning the fight, the changing room is full. And when they're losing the fight, nobody texts you and the changing room is empty. So I'm sure he's got good people around him, at least, you know, his family and 
training team and others, you know, I've seen Denzel Bentley come to support him. He's got mates in boxing now there to support him. But mm. I, I think my my sort of take of this is that fans won 50-50 fights and then when somebody loses, then they're willing to crucify them and not necessarily fans only, but people in boxing. So can't have it both ways. I think boxing needs to get out of this mentality of protecting the O. All right, then. What do you think about the spat between Eddie Hills and Bricktop? You mean four, four and O, oh, three by the way off, Eddie Hills? Four and O, oh, super heavyweight amateur star from Billy Ricky, three by way of. What do you think about Eddie Hills and Bricktop, the man with a pig farm? What do you think? <laughs> Don't mess with anybody that's got pigs. What do you think about their back and forth on IFL and their lo- and boxing social? They seem to be loving it, don't they, Coogan and Rob? Yeah, I think, hmm. I think, um, I mean, Frank's right to come out and protect his fighter, and that's what he should do. But also, do, uh, Joyce is his fighter as well, so obviously, he wants to protect the bar, but also promote Joyce at this point, but. You know, Eddie should show above class and probably not get involved. I know they stick a camera in his face and ask him questions and he'll give his opinion, but it's all about diminishing Frank's product at the expense of his fighters. And I just think it's, again, it doesn't help boxing grow, does it? No, Eddie wants to be the top dog, doesn't he? Look, we know Eddie's number one promoter in the UK at the moment, but it's like he don't want to work with Frank. And he wants to ru- to he wants to ruin him, doesn't he? Basically, that's what he looks like he's doing, doesn't he? He wants he wants to run him out at sport by the looks of it. What do you think? Yeah, but a monop- uh, monopoly is never very good in any sport, is it? I mean, you look at UFC as an example. The fight, you know, fighter pays pretty low. When you have monopoly, there's a lot of things. The competitiveness of some of the UFC events isn't great either. I mean, we have this across boxing, but. It's not a good thing. I mean, having Frank in the sport, whether you like him or not, is a good thing, having Frank and Eddie. And also, it's good for fighters because they can go where they can get the most platform. Eddie's struggling to get all of his guys out. So I just think it's quite petty. And, you know, as I said, you wouldn't see that in football, would you? When a team loses, you wouldn't see other managers actively going out and slagging them off. No. All right, then. Uh... Enough about the adventures of Tintin. What about the weekend's action? I think Yard against Lyndon Arthur is probably the fight that maybe should have happened before the Kovalev fight. Um, and I think, it, I think it's a good matchup. up um, I think it's a good domestic clash, good televised fight. So I'm quite excited about that one. That, that one much more so than Martin Murray against... Um, Billy Joe Saunders, just because I think Martin Murray isn't really a competitive opponent for Billy Joe Saunders, and yeah, it's not it's not a great fight or it's not a great card by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, uh, we know Martin Murray has been out at ring thirteen months and he's been slipped in rankings and been given a voluntary for a world title fight. You think that's where the sport shoots itself in the foot, Rico? Yeah, because ultimately we're going to have a TV fight that's not going to be particularly entertaining or competitive. Has Martin Murray got a chance? Uh, I mean, everybody has a chance when they step in the ring, but I think it's a fairly small chance. I've got there's no real evidence to suggest that Martin Murray poses any real problem to Billy Joe Saunders. Yeah. He's a he's a he's definitely a durable guy. Uh, but he's not the hardest of punches. And also, he's been out of the ring for quite a while. So what's going to be left? It's more about what Billy Joe Saunders brings in the night. And I hope, you know, he really needs to make a statement to get in there with the likes of Canelo and others. Because, you know, we've seen... How many years ago did he fight against Lemieux? Three years. And what's he done since? Nothing. Well, Exactly. Well, he's, he's won a world title at 168, but they were against nothing, guys, weren't they? But do you feel that 
Adam Smith is going to be coming out with Martin Murray's tough, his game, his durable. Do you think we're going to hear all that? Of course we will. And then we'll talk about the Triple G fight and how he withstood the hardest punch in at 160. And now he's more comfortable at 168. And, you know, he's a wise boxer and stuff. I, I think Martin Murray is a class act and is a good boxer, but I think it, it's a step too far for him. I like Martin Murray because he's done porridge, hasn't he? And turned his life around. Yeah. I like I like stories like that. Uh, but how many more fights do we have to see Billy Joe in where it's a tune-up? How many more tune-ups? Is he going to be out at good sport another year now and then come back with a tune-up? Or is he going to fight Canelo at 168? I think Canelo fights against whoever he wants, right? And I don't think Canelo takes too well to be you know, called a coward or anything else. And he gives an opportunity to guys that are respectful and Golovkin wasn't particularly respectful towards him. So I think Billy Joe Saunders falls into that category, but he had Andrade in that stable. You know, there's lots of fights to be made for Billy Joe Saunders. Danny Jacobs, um, you know, he's got a lot of good fights that can be made in house. So I don't think there's any reason even John Ryder, again, rematch. I, 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 you know, there's no real reason why these fights couldn't be made. Yeah. All right, then. Uh, what What about the Spence Garcia? Where do you see that fight, Eddie? Um, I think it's similar to what's been said before on your channel that it depends what's, how much of an impact the car crash had on Spence. By Spence is the same fighter he was before. He's just a special guy. But Danny Garcia is one of those fighters, I'd say a bit like Joe Joyce in the sense that his style isn't the most exciting. He's not particularly good at any single attribute. He's got a decent left hook, but he's a bit flat-footed. Um, but he always brings his best and he always comes to fight. And I think he will be a good fight to watch. And it will be, you know, high-level waterway boxing. Danny Garcia won't be outboxed in that fight, but I think Spencer has a knack of taking fighters into deep waters and drowning them. Yeah, I mean, I, I know you've just mentioned there about that car crash and that, but this is how I look at it. Before Errol Spence gets in that ring, he'll have a medical and he'll sign off to say that he's okay. He's just done a three-month camp, right? So he'll have gone through training, sparring, dieting. So... I don't want to hear off anybody about the car crash if he gets beat because before the fight, as I've just said, they're signed off that they're okay, aren't they? He's made all the check weights. He's done all them. Yeah, I mean, I take your point on that, but it's different doing the sparring than he has been in ring. Look at um, Kell Brook against, um, what do you call it? Kell Brook against Spence, right? Yeah that there's, there's certain damage and there's certain things that you'll only find out on night. And I think the real question here is, <laughs> if it's a very tough fight, will that have an impact? It could be just a blowout, or it could be just... And also, his fight against Spence fights are very, very sort of high intensity. Throws a lot of punches to the body, you know, close yeah. quarters fighting. That's quite... He's got quite a tough style on the physicals and it's not only the car crash it's also he's been out of the ring for quite a while he's set about Mayweather in his own gym sparring didn't he isn't that the story before um, the Pacquiao fight right and he got thrown yeah. out I asked uh, Derek James uh, Spencer's trainer about that when I met him out in Texas and <laughs> he, he, he didn't tell me the answer but you could basically tell because he said effectively well there's stories but the stories come from somewhere yeah they're not going to say the, the, say what happened because they, they want to work with Al Heyman well they do work with Al Heyman don't they yeah so they're not they're not going to rubbish Floyd Mayweather's name but there's people in industry that seen it who've, who've told other people that they, it were apparently it beat Mayweather up didn't it for a few, a few rounds and Mayweather mm -hmm. got on his bike and blah de blah. I mean, one minute Mayweather shouting the dog pound, the dog pound. The next minute is he's, he's running back like Johnny Nelson against Carlos de Leon. 
You're throwing a jab going backwards. Your uh, favourite fight to watch live. Johnny the Entertainer Nelson, the only man that could uh, cause insomnia while watching a boxing match. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, How do you see the fight? I see Errol Spence beating him on points. Danny Garcia has never been stopped, has he? He could take a punch. So I don't see him being stopped. I could be wrong. I mean, I've, <laughs> I've not got that many right recently, but I always tend to go with where the odds seem to look attractive, don't I? But... If I wasn't going to put a bet on this and I was just going to say, right, oh, I think wins, I'd say Errol spend some points. I think Danny Tar Garcia is tough. And I think that, are they both Al Heyman fighters? Yeah, yeah. yeah both of them are. Errol Spencer's more or less the favourite in it than Garcia because he's been beat on Garcia twice. Spen yeah, but you know what? Credit to Al Heyman, he'll match these guys again. So if you get beat, yeah. you go into other tough fights. You've got Sean Porter, uh, Danny Garcia, you know, other Walter Wade, Keith Thurman, yeah. who even if they get beat, they get matched tough again and they get good paydays. That's what the sport should be about. It should be about that and not about once you get beat, you get sidelined. Which, which brings me to... All right, we'll move on from Earl Spence Garcia. I've got Earl Spence to win uh, on points, but which brings me to Eddie Earn. We've got Danny Garcia. Uh, sorry, sorry. Danny Jacobs, Billy Joe, Callum Smith, John Ryder. Can't match any of them, can I? I know Ryder's fought Smith yeah. once, but we want it rematch. They're not, they're not matching them. He's keeping them all apart, isn't he? Yeah, which I don't understand, but I think I think at the moment what he's or what he always thinks, accountant by name, accountant by nature, is how do you maximize the income of all of the fighters to make as much money out of them? And that might be keeping them apart. He's doing also, that, got, oh, oh sorry, well. And also he doesn't have he's got a lot of dates and he needs to get headliners on, and he doesn't have the deepest of stables. Yeah, but he's doing that, Eddie, and he's thinking of a pound note, but it's to the detriment of the Sky Sports mm -hmm. TV deal he's got with them because they can't be happy with it. If they give him another deal, Sky Sports, we might as well pack up and go home, aren't we? Yeah, I mean, look, he's the best promoter in the country, um, at least by creating these events. But Good at promoting himself. He's relentless, mate. Leave him alone. <laughs> what, what happened to Eddie Earn's boxing game that we were bringing out in March? Where's that? Wow, who knows? There's a lot of promises. There's a lot of promises often. Hey, it's a bit like Tyson Fury's million travellers going to London on a TLM march, isn't it? Don't worry, they it's funded by the donation he made to the charity. What all seven million of it? <laughs> 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 Gonna give everybody seven quid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, he keeps them apart so that he can make as many shows at stateside and here as possible with them headlining against subpar opponents, which is not really what you want. But I've always noticed that Eddie, Hay Eddie Hearn's game is to try and move people up rankings and then you put them into fights where they might be the underdogs. So it's not about taking risks coming up or, you know, risks until there's massive rewards at the end. And that's why British fighters lose their bouts. Yeah. All right, then, moving on. The Tyson Fury. Let's talk about Tyson Fury, Frank Warren, Bob Aaron, the little little triangle. Do you feel that Frank Warren is now in a weaker position with, with Tyson Fury than he's ever been? Because he's put, Frank Warren doesn't take orders off anybody. If he's putting a fight and he's going to put it on, he said he will put in Caballel Tyson Fury on. He's been told he can't any by Bob Arum. So do you feel that Frank's now Frank now knows his role with Tyson Fury? And do you feel that maybe his his time might be coming to an end with Tyson Fury? In, um, the, in the UK, meaning the TV and all that. And do you feel that Eddie won't put the fight on until Tyson's a sky fighter? I think that's possible, right? Sky and BT, we don't have any evidence of them working together on a pay-per-view in the UK. So I think 
those are negotiations that are going around in the background. I think Top Rank will own half the rights and Matchroom will own the other half. Yeah. And they'll go for... I mean, Top Rank has no real incentive of putting anything on BT or Sky. Whatever pays the best, they'll, they'll put the fight on that. Yeah. And um, it could be that they do it without Frank and that's the only way to do it. Because they keep talking about this Joshua Fury fight next year, but we all know they're not going to put it on without a gate, don't we? No, too course. much money being left on the table, isn't there? Of course, unless they do it in the Middle East or China. Yeah, yeah, but could they? I mean, could they be forgiven by British fans for for doing that? I mean, could you imagine FA Cup final being played in China, Man United and Man City in Cup final? Oh, we'll play in China. Would you rather see the fight in the next year, or would you rather wait for two years and then have it at Wembley? You watching it from home does it matter? I'd rather wait, me, Rico. Um. I'd just rather see the fight because, you know, boxing has a knack of the longer you marinate fights, the longer the likely is that these fights don't happen. Marinate? You mean bubbling? Yeah. Like Dennis Hobson. Russ, I've got some at bubbling. Sit tight. Don't go flaring up on your channel. We've got it some at, some at bubbling. So, Dennis, it's stuck to the pan. <laughs> <laughs> uh... All right, then. so you think that it could it's going to be in 2022 then, don't you, Rico, by the sounds of it? Yeah, I mean, even if then, I don't think it's necessarily ever going to happen because can Tyson Fury and Joshua agree on a split and the league goes get in the way? I saw Joshua today say something along the lines that Fury doesn't bring any gate, so he, he needs, um, Joshua needs, or Fury needs Joshua to bring in the live crowds. He brings American TV, Tyson Fury, doesn't he? He's big over there, isn't he? Oh, yeah, he brings ESPN. He but brings- again, ESPN and DAZN, that's another challenge, isn't it? I think the kids want to fight. I think Tyson wants to fight him. I think he takes him to school. I think Joshua probably just wants to get more money because he's money motivated, isn't he, Joshua? Yeah, I think it's... I think fighters often want the fight by teams wanting every single ounce of money they can get and that's you think about someone like Freddie Cunningham right if Joshua loses or retires from the sports what what's left for Freddie Cunningham managing a Coley yeah oh god that'd be like just torture wouldn't it that yeah uh, alright then what do you think about this £25 Joshua Poole F which is on next week, by the way. But it doesn't seem to be getting much mention in press, does it, or anything, does it? It seems to have gone under radar, doesn't it? Do you think it's happening? Um, yeah, I think, it, I think it is happening, but I don't think they're expecting huge numbers. Uh, it's just not an exciting fight. Do you feel that it being £25 and that people who work at Sky who are saying that Rush, you can't blame Eddie Earn and Adam Smith. It's Joshua who, who, who's not budging with the money. And obviously, I've come out and I said, well, if that's the case, and I shouldn't have said it with Eddie Earn being greedy and that, he's just a guy that's going to take the fall for it, isn't he, Eddie <clears throat> and Bean? Well, that's what they paid to do, right? Yeah, that's what they paid to do. To make them, they'll make Joshua look like Mary Poppins, won't they? He, he won't want to talk about pay-per-view prices and all that. He'll just say, oh, I'll leave it to my promoter. But it's looking like Joshua's calling the shots with the money, isn't it? I think he always has. Yeah, I do from day one. He has his own deal with Sky, which is independent of Matchroom's deal. Yeah. But my argument is this. We all know that Tom Little got paid chicken feed when he fought in Saudi and Joshua got 80 million. So if a man like Tom Little can get, what, what, what do they get? 30 grand or something? Yeah. Joshua's got 80 million pound. Die, all you people out there have got a calculator. Divide 30 grand into 80 million. Now, Tom Little did a camp with Joshua, didn't he? Right? Mm-hmm. So he's up at EIS, bad Joshua. He's gone out there, did his best, got stopped, didn't he? How can a man do a camp with somebody else and one man get £80 million and the other one get 
what is it, 0.002% or something. It's, it's, it's madness, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, the fight owns the show, right? So Joshua has pretty cheap fights on the card. Uh, obviously, this time they've got Coley in a world title shot. Uh, who else do they have? Case Ashfer uh, on the card, Team Joshua. So they'll have a lot of Joshua fighters and a few others, cheap fighters. And that's just how they build the card. But actually, a lot of these Joshua cards and others, you could do them with two undercard fights in the main event. People aren't tuning in for the undercard, are they? I think no, but I, I I like Tom Little. Me, I think he's a capable fighter. If he'd have applied himself more, I think he could have done well. Could have done better, should I say? And I, I just I just feel for him really going in with a guy like that because Joshua won't really won't really want to want to fancy him down the line, will he? But yet they've put Tom Little in with him. It's a bit like with Dave Allen and Louis Ortiz, isn't it? You yeah, know that it's kind of man- it's bad management, isn't it? That's why it, why it really comes down to if you're looking after your fighters' interest and you realistically know they level, then you don't accept fights like that. I couldn't do that. I couldn't be one of them people that sat there like this is a cake, and I'm having all of the cake, and I'm just gonna give you. It's like giving somebody a crumb off the cake, and it ain't even a slice of cake. It's not if it's a cake and you cut it into sixteen. You got sixteen teams, right? teams you know what I mean don't you yeah well if it's not even a team is it it's 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 like a a team of a team of a team it's it it doesn't sit well with me that a bit like Tyson Fury getting all them millions in Vegas and Isaac Lowe coming away with, with, with crumbs and I think that's where boxing shoots itself in foot me yeah, but the Isaac Lowe thing is different, right? He lives out in Vegas by Tyson Fury's house. He's trained by Tyson's trainer, whether that was, well, at the time it was Ben Davidson. Uh, so he gets a lot of extra out of it and his profile's a lot bigger um, out of it. But whereas you think about Joshua, I imagine the conversations go, you own the show. This is how much it's going to bring you. How much are you willing to give the undercard fight? in total versus he might say a couple of hundred grand and then off we go. And then whoever wants to take a slice of that couple of hundred grand, they take it. But that's where management comes in, where management says actually it worth a lot more money. There's no real upside fighting on Joshua Undercard. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh yeah, it just leaves a bad taste in my mouth. All right then well let's finish off on let's finish off on Dennis's show. I'll give Dennis a free plug for his show. Uh, do you see it happening next Friday? Uh, I think it really depends on the government restrictions, as in what's allowed. If you guys are in tier three up there, yeah, you, you can't really have people congregating in cars for leisurely activity. I don't think, so, although it's high-level sports, I don't think that's something that necessarily will be encouraged that people even come in cars because you're going to have to have toilets there, won't you? And have to have points where you sell food and drink or, you know, some ticketing system. So I'm not sure whether that can happen in the tiered restrictions that you are in. So it, it depends on that because otherwise you're quite down the road with the show. Yeah. Do you think it's a gamble by Dennis to put a show on uh, where, like that? I think he has, I mean, look, he has to keep his boxes active because the reality is that if you don't put these shows on, you know, your boxes get poached by MTK and others. Yeah. Cash Alley's not got an opponent. Yeah, but they'll find him one. You know how he's in boxing, TV, you know, versus uh, TBC. What do you think about RV on and uh, Tommy Frank's teams? Dennis, obviously, and Mark Tibbs as well, they've all agreed, all agreed for Arvion to fight Tommy for IBF European, and then a drop of well, a drop of a hat. It's just, it's not happened. Sanctioning issues. Who knows? Maybe the money, maybe the money that isn't there for the sanctioning fee in the format of the show, what the show's been held. So if it's a drive-in show, maybe the money isn't there. Yeah, what do you and think? Maybe it's a big fight. It's a big enough fight that you think actually we want some fans for this. 
you feel that the boxing board are control of Shafted Dennis because they sanctioned the fight for Kyle Yusef, Tommy Frank, for British title. Kyle Yusef was a Steffi Ball fighter, even in Steffi. Kyle Yusef's a Steffi Ball fighter, and he's ended up getting COVID. So they've drafted Harvey Ornin, but the board has said, no, it's not a British title fight now. Harvey Ornin's 8-0. Kyle were, I think he was 16 and I was something like that. Point I want to make is that now they're saying that RV Orn and Kyle Youssef is a British title fight. But why wasn't Tommy Frank and Harvey Orn a British sanction for British? Do you think do you feel that the board have got an agenda with Dennis if the, if they can put Kyle Youssef Harvey Orn on for a British and not Tommy and Harvey Horn for the for the belt? Yeah, probably, but they're losing out some money because can he see, you know, Harvey Horn fight against Kyle Yusuf unless it's on a Queensbury show or, you know, and is that top yeah. of France's agenda? Probably not. I don't know. You just get the belts in circulation. That's my view. You know, let somebody fight for the belt and then you can call a mandatory for the, you know, it could be Kyle Yusuf, the mandatory against the winner. Yeah, but there's not how many people's in that division in Britain? There's only about 10 people at that weight, yeah. isn't there? Well, you know, you've got three undefeated fighters, so... Three undefeated fighters, all 8-0 and oh upwards. How can that not be? When other people have fought for British titles who've had uh, records that were less than 8-0, oh, you know, 5-0, and 4-0, oh, oh, I'm sure there is if, you go, if people go look. So I, I just feel that uh, Robert Smith stuck it to Dennis there. Maybe it's all the videos you've done, Porky. Maybe, maybe Robert Smith, come see me. So and you, Charlie Giles, you're a wrong one as well. <laughs> and your nose is in trough too long. Get some money sorted out for England boxing and all these amateur setups instead of putting your nose in trough. It's great though, isn't it, Rico? Yeah, I mean, look, boxing should look. Imagine football. You know, the Premier League clubs, although they wanted some stuff, they club together and gave some money and imagine Premier League clubs saying that we're not going to give any money to lower leagues where they send players on loan and poach players from and you know it's a developing ground it's it's just classic boxing where you focusing on the top level just to diminish what's going to come next because unless they get all of this amateur club money sorted then what's going to happen is you're not going to be good fighters aren't going to be produced and more fighters are going to go into other sports yeah, I'm worried about this amateur setup because this is the grassroots at boxing, isn't it? And if if they start, if they don't help the amateur setup, there's nobody in 20 years from now there ain't going to be anybody boxing, is there? We're going to have no. people like Glenn McCrory coming back, pushing 57 year old for a payday. Well, wow, exactly. What do you think about that, Glenn McCrory, Evander Holyfield, BKB? I think. Um... Yeah, I'm not a fan of it, but if it gives Glenn some peace and closure, then so be it. I mean, I won't be tuning in to watch, but if that makes him happy and it's done in a safe setup, then fair enough, it's their prerogative. I feel for Glenn in a way because he's he's on he's having a bad run in in life in general, and uh, but I don't think that turning to that to, to having a bare knuckle fight with Evander Holyfield. For everybody to see, I, I just don't know. At that age, it's craziness, isn't it? It might be a um, Nigel Benn situation where they train and one of them pulls out and then they decide, okay, that's fine. Yeah, it might. It might. They might think, you know what? I ain't got it no more. Hopefully, yeah. I don't want to see that. Yeah, but they might fall in love. I mean, Glenn might fall in love with training again and you know get back on straight and narrow. <laughs> we'll leave that at that then eh? <laughs> alright then well listen it's been a pleasure Rico I know you're a very busy man uh, I hope you're alright yeah good keep supporting boxing thanks for having me and I thought uh, come midweek rather than the weekend because you had a few people come on the weekend and stuff and you know keep plugging yeah. the channel and people keep supporting and liking and subscribe yeah, people. I've been looking on analytics today. Loads of people have been sharing my videos, so that's, that's good. good. Right? All yeah, of course. the Porky uh, Express trains. You're gonna start doing Porky mugs again. 
Porky Mugs. Uh, we might do. Yeah, I'm, I'm waiting. I'm going to speak to somebody. Porky, I've been asked by uh, a good friend of mine to, uh, if we'll be interested in doing Porky merchandise. Uh, you know what? People can comment at the at the bottom if they will be buying Porky merchandise because there's no point in uh, no point in getting it done if people aren't going to buy. No point in buying another 500 mugs as a front of city <laughs> factory. <laughs> <laughs> that, you know what I mean but uh, but yeah the more you buy the cheaper they are yeah well let's get a pallet of them <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's all good in it but I think that we might be doing porky t-shirts in no year there's no profit you know if you make a quid a t-shirt you still got to go post office to post it aren't you yeah exactly you put postage up postage is more than t-shirt isn't it <laughs> yeah, that is true that is true uh, it's all a bit of fun, isn't it? If we break even on it, I'll be happy. I all mean, right, well, a good weekend of boxing, anyways, ahead. What uh, yard against Lyndon Arthur and it's a good Spencer. fight, that it's a good fight, though, but it should have been 18 months ago, shouldn't it? Yeah, it should have been behind side. Such a great thing, isn't it? I mean, Anthony Yard's gone from fighting people that are not really on his level to Kovalev, and then he's come back to fighting a gimme fight, and now Lyndon Arthur. Lyndon Arthur's got a good job though, so he could he could surprise a few people. He's, yeah, it could be. I mean, he's a good amateur, a, isn't he? Very good fighter, yeah. So that's a good fight, but I would have liked to have seen it 18 months ago. If Lyndon Arthur wins that, he is in the big time. He is, but look, um, Tundi and Anthony's team, they've done a great job in making a lot of money for him and building him sort of out of nothing. And he's one of the characters in British boxing I like more than most people. I've met him a few times in York Hall. He goes to shows and, you know, he's a thoroughly nice kid and does a lot in his community. Yeah, you know, he's you know involved what? in that. He's a success story, Anthony. He is. And he's not one of them people that's hanging out of the back of IFL on a daily basis, is he? Like no. the usual suspects. So no. for that, I like Anthony Yard and I'm an Anthony Yard fan. So Anthony Yard, if you're watching, come see me. <laughs> no, don't uh, see me. Don't. <laughs> you know what? He's quite short of a guy. He's, he's shorter than I am. I'm just under six foot one, and he's he's must be six foot at best. Could have been a sprinter, he's, couldn't he? Yeah, I mean, he's built. He's one of those guys short, but he's a built guy. But he does a lot around that. Like a Ben Johnson, isn't he? Yeah, <laughs> without the roids. About he, the does, he does a lot around that box up to crime, which is. Stephen, whatever his name is, charity thing where they get kids into boxing gyms and they um, try and get them out of gangs and stuff. So he's always down there talking to the kids, and you know he's a yeah he's a role model. He's a good character all around, and I don't think anybody has anything bad to say about. No, him. I like him actually. I, I like his trainer. Get used to used to so used to get on my nerves. His trainer used to really get up my nose, but I've watched the thing that he does with Spencer X. I love it. Yes. Spencer, Sorry, no, Spencer Fearon, yeah. You know, where they wear the same T-shirt or something. Have you seen it? They wear matching yeah. T-shirts. Um, yeah. Is that actually, Spencer's actually, he, he comes across all right in that, Spencer, because he can rub people up the wrong way, can't he, Spencer? But they come across as a good double act. I don't. They laugh too much, though, don't they? They seem to laugh at anything. Yeah. Well, they are mates. They are mates from a long, long time ago. But, yeah, um... yeah, but they come across all right, but... I think that that Tund is pretty, pretty shrewd, and I think he protects his fighters. So quite I'm well, he I'm takes. Up. Yeah, he's a bit like Sam Jones in that term. Yeah. that he, it's the old Fergie thing, right? After Man United used to lose a game, and Fergie used to say something controversial or blame the ref, and that became the headlines rather than team yeah, yeah, yeah. So they know what they're doing, and you know he's got Anthony Yard, a Adidas contract, and you know he makes money from other streams outside of boxing. I think Yard's one of those guys that he'll end up doing other stuff outside of boxing and he's not yeah. just reliant on boxing income. So they build something good and actually having a connection between a trainer and a fighter of that level. Uh, he didn't throw him under the bus or didn't get rid of him after that cover that fight. As most people were, again, clamouring for that to happen. And Yeah. Yeah. All right, then. Well, we wish them well. All right, then, Rico. Well, listen, you have a great day, and I will speak to you later. All right, my Thank friend. You too, mate. Thank you, okay. fans. Cheers. Bye, bye. Bye. Well, that were Rico, a.k.a.
the real knowledge of uh, London, the voice of real real boxing. <laughs> we'll have to think of a nickname for Rico. Uh, very well spoken young man, born in Finland, lives in London. For those of you that don't know, he's a really really bright kid, speaks fluent languages. But what would he be knocking around with a dosser like me for? <laughs> I don't know, but he's my pal and I like having him on here and he seems to be popular in comment section. So thank you for tuning in. All right. Thank you for liking, sharing and subscribing and leaving a comment, whether it's good or bad. I don't care. If you want to come on the channel, it's porkycorner at mail.com. If, you, if you're brave enough, if you're not brave enough, what's point in leaving abusive comments and sending vile emails. Be a man and come on channel. Look, it might even be women sending them, but we're not really bothered, are we? But come on channel. Don't hide behind your accounts. Come on the channel. Be real, people. Be real. Turn up and be real. So come on Porky's Corner on Zoom, all right? And be part of the movement. And you'll get a free pass then on the Porky Express train. Peace out.